tell you what, if you could bottle the presence of God like we had today, Jim Beam would go out of business. Did you know that? There'd be no need for Jack or Jim or any of the other boys because the presence of God is so sweet. In the middle of the praise and worship service, God changed my sermon just a little bit, so I'm only going to have the first two slides and the rest of it, we're just going to get into the Word and I'll have to go and build the slides to put into the video. But God wants to, wants to heal, God wants to restore, doesn't he? And I want to deal with the, the veil in the tabernacle. Uh, most people never cover that as part of the furniture, but how many know it really is? And we need to understand there's spiritual warfare involved in the veil. And we're going to get into that because what I want you guys to be, I want you guys to really be free. We think of spiritual warfare as when you get the unction and you think you can just yell at the devil and just call him every name under the sun and, and you stomp your feet and walk off and say, boy, I told him I've done spiritual warfare this morning. That's not really spiritual warfare. That's not the true essence of spiritual warfare. Uh, number one, you don't understand authority. You know, someone who really understands authority doesn't have to yell it. And you also respect authority. You know, when the Michael, the archangel, he didn't rebuke the devil when he was fighting over, he said, the Lord rebuke you. He, he understood and respected authority. And I think if the devil can get you in the flesh doing spiritual warfare, he can eat your lunch. And we have had a lot of believers that have gotten their lunch eaten because they didn't really understand the, the entire premise of spiritual warfare. I was actually going to kind of teach this up or some of the things I'm going to get in this morning. I'm kind of working into an article. So you're getting a sneak preview of some other things that just kind of folded in on this this morning. But I think one of the, the most awesome verses in the entire Bible about the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies is found in Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 through 53. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many." I mean, we could stop there and talk about the gospel according to Uncle Bert that died three weeks or six years before Jesus died, and we could talk about that. But what I want to center in on is when Jesus died on the cross, that veil was rent, not from bottom to top. How many know that thing was so, so thick that no man could have done it to begin with? But it was rent from top to bottom. God's hands took that thing and rent it because he was saying, you now have access to my throne. You now have access to me. But how many believers do we know that really don't have access the way they should? There's not a flowing of what is in the Holy of Holies into their lives, and we've got to ask why. So the first thing that I want to do, I want to go, we need to understand some basic things. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Here's where I depart from my slides. How I many know preachers preached before there was PowerPoint? Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, and, and in the beginning, in better sheet, God created the heaven and the earth. We need to understand that, there, that our universe is something that is created. Now, in this, we don't know if the, what we call the spirit realm, how many know that that is a dimensional reality, the spirit realm? We talk about things of the spirit. And the spirit realm is the parent reality. And I'm kind of getting into quantum physics just a little bit. But everything was birthed out of the spirit realm that God stood in nothing, and when he spoke, he created everything. The apostle Paul tells us that there was one that he knew that was caught up to the third heaven. 
Biblically, there are three. Kabbalah tries to get seven because they like that number. There's three according to the Word of God. The third heaven is heaven itself, the realm where God dwells. The second heaven, it's a spiritual realm, but we would call it where principalities and powers and rulers of darkness dwell. It's kind of like a, a demilitarized zone. If, you'd ever, if you've ever been in the military in Korea, there's a barrier separating North Korea from South Korea. And I don't know how many millions of landmines are between it. That's a demilitarized zone. The second heaven is where Satan loves to rule and loves to manipulate mankind. The first heaven is our universe. It's not just the atmosphere around our planet. It is the universe itself. And so when God spoke, God created this universe out of nothing except the power of his word. So everything in this universe is subject to spiritual things. It's the parent. It's not, it's not, it's not vice versa. You, you cannot... In any type of physics, if something created something, it's, it's like your Ford motor car. If you have a Ford out here, that Ford motor company is not subject to that car. That car is subject to Ford motor company. They can issue a recall on it. They can, come on. They're the, they're the ones that tell you what the best way for that thing to function, what to put in the gas tank, what to, all these different things. The car doesn't write Ford motor company and say, no, I'm changing everything. It's the child. And so everything is subject to the spirit realm. And we don't really realize that. Especially within our Western culture, we, we try to dismiss the, the spirit realm. And they try to tell us there is no such thing. Well, all the time, all scientists are trying to pierce into that which they say doesn't exist. That's the whole reason for the CERN Collider. They're trying to find out the God particle, how to pierce over into something beyond our physical realm. Isn't that an oxymoron for scientists? We're going we're gonna to prove how the universe existed by piercing into something that we tell everybody, we tell all the Christians don't exist. We Christians know about it, don't we, if we really understand the word. Now, I want to show you something here in Genesis 2 and 7. I'm going to let you find it. And the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, formed man out of the dust of the ground. Why did God have to do that? To give you authority here. There's a reason why you have an earth suit. So that you can function here. And he breathed his spirit into man. And man became a living soul. And so everybody, when they, when they try to do their charts, they, have you ever seen the chart of man? They have like three circles piled up on top of each other. It looks like a chain. And they say spirit, soul, and body. I like the way that Watchman Nee did, did, Watchman nee did it in his book, The Spiritual Man. He said that when God breathed spirit into man, where, the, where there was a joining of spirit and flesh, where there was a joining of earth and spirit, there had to be a connector between the two. And God created the soul when he breathed into that mud man. He breathed into him. And, and nephesh in the Hebrew does not be like soul, like we would say soul, like the will, mind, and emotion. Nephesh in the Hebrew means the whole make of man, his spirit, his soul, his body. All of it is nephesh. And so instead of being three, it's, it's kind of like two circles like this, and right here where they join together has the soul, so that man's spirit could interact with the physical world. Say, so, well, Mike, yeah, what, does that, what does that have to do with taters on a hill? I want to know right now. What we don't understand is that everything in the spirit, in the soul, and of the flesh flow back and forth. You can do physical things that are spiritual. Can't you? When you lift up your hands and worship God, that is your flesh involved, it involves your soul, and it affects the spirit. If God comes and moves on you, it starts spirit, 
and it flows into the soul and it flows into the flesh. It can affect you physically. That's how we're healed. As the Spirit of God flows into this flesh body and begins to do things. How many always enjoy the anointing or enjoy this, the presence of God? You can, uh, we, sometimes Pentecostals, we call it getting Holy Ghost goosebumps, you know? But what we have never connected is how I think, how I feel, what I speak, and what I do can affect the spirit realm and either open doors or close doors, and it can affect me. One of the things that witches love to do, they love to go on the astral plane, and I've kind of got my own theory about the astral plane. I think it's kind of that space between our realm and the second heaven. Because they think if they go up there and they can manipulate things, it'll change things here on the earth. They'll try to, they'll try to embed sickness in somebody or, or, or different things. Guys, if I do something physical, it can affect my soul and it can affect my spirit. The church doesn't understand that. We think that we can get away with anything that we want and it's not, there's not going to be repercussions. Or that I can think any way that I want. Come on now. And not knowing it's going to wound our spirit. Did you know that your brain, part of, part of the function of the brain, it can secrete over 1,000 different chemicals into your body. If you walk in unforgiveness your brain will begin releasing a chemical that will literally dry up all the lubricants in every joint you have in your body. But by walking in joy, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. When, when you walk in joy, it actually causes your body to increase the lubrication of all the joints, and it causes your serotonin levels to rise, and it, causes, it actually will boost your immune system. You say, what, is, what has this got to do with, with anything? Let me show you. Th this is how the devil thinks. You find Jesus, and you start getting into that holy place, but you never go past there. You never go to the throne of God. You never really get into the holy of holies. You know why? Within your soul, he builds a wall. He builds a wall because your soul is where all your wounds are. Your soul is where all the misconcepts are. He begins building a wall, and the stronger that he, I believe that he can sense that you're supposed to walk with God, the more junk comes into your life. I have discovered that my adulthood is all about overcoming my childhood for a lot of people. And that, is, that has really been the way it has been since Adam. I mean, you know, Adam and Eve had two sons. Their junk showed up, one killed the other. So the very first family was messed up. First thing that happens is they sin, they get kicked out of the garden. Like what Mike Warnke said, he said, as they were leaving the garden, Adam turned to Eve and said, a woman, you ate us out of house and home. You know? <laughs> But that, that sin, because the devil convinced them that they could be more than what God had given them. And how many know you can't be more than that which the infinite gives you? That so they begin having problems. And so in our, in our childhood, in our life, Satan's strategy is I have got to come and I have got to implant things in your soul. It's where the spirit and the flesh connect. That way it can affect you spiritually. It can affect you physically. You see, really what every one of these bricks represent is called a stronghold. And we so many times in the body of Christ, we talk about strongholds. You know, I got the power of God to overcome a stronghold. What is the definition of a stronghold? It's a fort. Did you ever play cowboys and Indians when you were a kid and you have a fort? Well, the first thing you do is you put walls up around the fort. And you put a gate. There's a gatekeeper in the fort. And what we have never thought about is, I wonder what's stuck in the fort. 
Every one of these blocks of, we, we could put, we have deceit here, we have vain imaginations, emotional wounds, self-hatred, unforgiveness, religion, false concepts, the philosophies of men. We could add shame. We could add rejection. Every single one of those blocks is an individual stronghold that Satan saw to it that he placed within our lives to keep us out of the holy of holies. Because that's where the real power is. That's where the real authority is. That's where the real provision is, is once you can make your way into the Holy of Holies. And it took the cross for Jesus to rent to make the way, so Satan built a wall. Now, I want us to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians chapter 10, starting with verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. How many know it's not something physical is your greatest challenge? It's that of the soul. Because the soul was created where the spirit and the flesh meet, or the physical realm meet. Therefore, in the soul, you can have spirit. Just think about that for a minute. What, what, what is represented in the holy place? The oil, the lamp, the Holy Spirit. So spirit can dwell there. We have physical territory within our soul. In fact, the closest thing that we can see is when the children of Israel walked over and crossed the Jordan, they had to drive out all the ites. All the ites dwell in the soul, but they are spiritual. When you look up the original meaning of the Jebusites and the Pezusites and all the other ite brothers, they mean things like unforgiveness. They mean things like hatred and procrastination and all these different things. And you go back to the very root of their meaning. And God was saying when you, when you get saved and you, when you're delivered and you cross over the Jordan, it's now your job. I'm handing you weapons to drive the ites out of your territory that God has given you. In other words, you save your soul. This is going to click here in a minute. Your spirit man gets saved when you get born again. Your spirit was dark and he was cut off from God. Now he's alive to God. James tells us that we need to receive with meekness the engrafted word that for the believer, for the saved believer, is able to save his soul. There's stuff in the word that shows us the enemy so that we can drive out that enemy out of our lives. Your spirit, man, once you got saved, has never gotten you into problems. Never. He's always saying, do the will of God. Do the word of God. <laughs> Go back to the word. It's what is between your ears has always gotten you into problems. I don't know how many times I've said in counseling in the words, well, I thought. Well, either they think or they do exactly what the Apostle Paul says, think not. I believe that right there. I'm just going to stay right there. Either they're thinking the wrong stuff or they're not thinking at all. They're acting out of instinct, out of things built into this wall. Now, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but look what it says there. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. That word mighty there in the Greek means the ability to do anything. The weapons that God has given us have the ability to do whatever God tells us to do to the pulling down of strongholds. That's these bricks in this wall. God has given us the supernatural ability to overcome the past. There's hope. Why? Because a lot of these bricks cause what uh, we, we deal with the counseling all the time, self-sabotage. You're about to get over. You're about to get through. And the devil doesn't have to make you mess up. You mess up and you sabotage your stuff. You're about to get out of debt. You're about to turn things around. And then you wake up 
with a nine, you know, a ninety thousand dollar car or an eighty thousand dollar car sitting in the driveway, or you just have to have a new house. Why do you have to have a new house? Wasn't the old one good enough? Yes, but I deserve. And next thing you know, you're now two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand dollars in debt for something maybe you really didn't need. How many of us have done that? We go on a spending rampage when our when our goal was to get out of debt. Or we decide we're going to lose weight. And so every day after you decide to lose weight, every day you eat lunch at an all-you-can-eat buffet, and several of the managers wanted to tell you, Bubba, that's all you get to eat for nine ninety-five, And your appetite is uncontrollable. Every package you see is a package looking to get emptied. Doesn't even matter if it tasted good or not. Or you decided that you were going to walk in love and all of a sudden rage begins to come up. And I'm going to walk in love. Glory to God. Oh, if I just had a stick. <laughs> you know, all these things come up because what we've not realized. See, the devil doesn't even like the PowerPoint working this morning. No, don't stare at that because you're going to get it in a minute if you do. Every one of those blocks is a stronghold. And inside of that stronghold is an influence by a demonic force. You see, if someone had a spirit of anger and they leashed out at anger at you and wounded you, that wound became a stronghold in your life and a spirit entered into it. Come on now. Why is it that 99% of those who sexually abuse others were sexually abused as a child. It's because when they were sexually abused, there was a wound there that created walls, and it filled those walls with the very spirit that did that to them. So that you, you have spiritual a spiritually sexually transmitted disease that you will, that you, as, as you're compelled when you get older, that as you abuse others, you infect them who infect the others. And, and this keeps on going generation after generation after generation. Guys, there has to be a time that we say, it stops here and it stops now because I have been given weapons that are strong to the pulling down of every stronghold, that I have the ability to bind up the strong man in that stronghold and to cast him and to drive him out of my life. I am tired of those things in that wall making me do things I don't want to do. Making me feel things I don't want to feel. Making me look for significance in places that never really give significance. Can we think back on how many stupid things that we've done in our life thinking, boy, when I do this, I'm really going to feel good about myself? Oh, my Lord. Yeah, it really sounded good at the time. Everybody else was doing it. Let's just look at hairdos just for a moment. Did you ever look back at 10, 15, 20-year-old hairdos? There, there was the era of the poofy girl. <laughs> I mean, if your hair couldn't be up about this tall, you just were not fashionable, and the torture and everything that you did to get your hair that poofy... And all it took was a little cloud going over you and you ran because you knew it was all going to get flat and turned to cement because of all the stuff that was in your hair. And now we look back at that and we say, isn't that the goofiest thing that I have ever seen in my life? Or some of the fashions that go through. You see, those, those are kind of metaphors for some of the things that we do in life, thinking, I'm going to make my... Because what happens is that the strongholds can speak. And you sometimes I've heard Christians establish ministries that didn't come from the throne, they came from the wall. Oh, well, Mike, how can that happen? Well, you see, brother, this, the Word of God, is it really the Word of God? And truth is like springs. And you, so you interpret this based upon how you jump on it. 
Now, I may know that's probably the most asinine thing anybody's ever said in their life, but we have an entire movement sweeping the body of Christ with that very philosophy. How many know that that was a spirit of lies, a spirit of error that formed a stronghold? And so as people receive that, it begins to infect their soul, and error begins, in, you know, God didn't, has God really said, isn't that the first thing the enemy did? Has God not said, now, God didn't really mean that was sin. God didn't mean this was bad. God, come on now. I mean, we can, we can go and ad nauseum. We can go into how many different things the world is saying, oh, that, and if you really stick up for this, how I many know you're kind of sticking out like a sore thumb right now? People say, well, you're just a hate monger. To hate sin, to hate evil, is to love God. And so if that makes me a hate monger, then I am. I'm mongering up on all the evil, and I hate it. Because it brings nothing but misery and destruction to the world. I hate sin. I hate lies. I hate the vain philosophies of men. I hate paganism. I hate anything that has brought misery to the world. I hate religion. Because religion is a formulated way of man trying to work his way to God. God brought us relationship and brought us a kingdom, and there's no religion about it. So the two things that we've got to deal with, remember Jesus said that nobody can, can raid a man's house unless he binds up the strong man. Every fort has a gate. If you understand anything about gates, whether they were gated cities in Jesus' day, every gate has a gatekeeper. And this is where staying true to the Word of God is so important because that gatekeeper will keep you away from that fort. He'll keep the anointing out. He'll keep the blood out. Rejection. Well, the, the blood of Jesus couldn't cover that cover you with shame, cover you with this, cover you with that. that he'll, he'll whisper anything into your ear so that you never get to the strong man to get him by the throat. Am I making sense this morning? Yes. Or, what you do really doesn't matter. <laughs> it's all good. No. What I do in the flesh always starts with a thought. It always starts in the soul, but it flows both ways. It not only affects the flesh or this earthly realm, it can affect me spiritually, it can affect me emotionally, and it can affect me physically. It's all connected. That's why one of the first steps a believer can do is when I choose not to do paganism, it's the first step to freedom because I realize there are certain things in the physical realm that I should not do. You know, why does God tell us not to eat pork? Is it because he has something against pigs? He looked at that thing and said, that's the ugliest thing I think I ever created. Nobody should ever eat that. Or how about that that is his garbage disposal? Now, wouldn't you, guys, wouldn't you think something was wrong with a family if they eat everything that only comes out of the garbage disposal? That'll make, that's bad. That'll make you sick. And we go around, we pay top dollar for garbage disposal meat that has nothing but the toxins. And God said, don't eat it. But he also is trying to get another point across. There are certain things in this physical world that you should never, ever receive. Isn't isn't that what you teach little kids? Because what little kids do? They'll run around anything. The dog bowl is fair game. Trash dumped out. On the side of the house, it's fair game. If you let a little kid, they will take anything and put it in their mouth, won't they? And what does God say? Bad, yucky, don't eat that. Because if you can get that, you can understand the greater precepts of the kingdom. There are things you should never allow into your life because they will make you sick. They're bad, they're unclean, they're nasty. Or to bring it down on a profound theological term, They're yucky, okay? Yucky, bad, no, don't. But yet now we're teaching there is no yucky. There is no yucky. 
Just receive it all in. It's all good. It's all been redeemed. How many know demons don't get redeemed? They get cast out. Satan gets cast into a lake of fire. He does not get redeemed. Yet we are having theologians with hyper grace teach today that one day Satan will get redeemed. I had a supposed leading authority on, on deliverance and on mind control and all that try to tell me that when you cast out a demon, you should always tell it to go before the throne of God so that God can redeem that demon. Uh, yeah. What? I'm thinking, well, 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 yeah, you know, since you were former Illuminati, I can understand how that you can think that and that you've not quite got all the eggs in the right carton yet. <laughs> but everybody was looking to them for all the answers because they understood mind control. Can you see how dangerous this stuff is? You, there, there, were, there were blocks in the wall that Satan had built in that individual's life that were keeping them from, from sound theology. And how many churches and ministers are built today off of the bricks in the wall instead of the true things that God put within the court? Are you ready to go to work? Because you see, our, our, when, we're, when we're wandering in the wilderness, it's manna and God protecting us. But if you really want to step into the kingdom, God says, I put a sword in your hand, I put a shield in the other hand, I put armor on you, and I tell you, let my word identify the ites and go get them, boys, and don't let them, uh, don't let them have a minute's rest until you drive them out of your life. And every one of those bricks in that wall are things that we need to have driven out of our lives. And the Apostle Paul tells us how to do it. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians. I closed my Bible when I shouldn't have because I still got more to read. For the weapons of our warfare, pick up it with verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Against the knowledge of God. Every one of those bricks in that wall is against something that God has said. If I had a dollar for every time in America that if a woman is sexually abused or raped, the, the prosecuting attorney says, well, she was asking for it by the way she was dressed. Well, she was wearing jeans and, you know, the, the, she was wearing this, she was doing that. How many know that's a bunch of bull? But the first thing the enemy tries to tell you is that you deserved it. There was something inherently wrong with you and that you deserved what happened to you. That's against the knowledge of God. It was not the will of God. Listen to me. It was not the will of God. God can tempt no man with evil. How many know those things are evil? He cannot try to change the course of your life using evil. God cannot do it. God will not do it. It is against his very character to do it. There was evil loosed in the earth when Adam bowed his knee to Lucifer and committed high treason unto God. And it loosed some things. And that evil flowed with the authority lines that was over your life. That's why, as a believer, I've got to take my authority seriously. If I do and get, my, get that wall cleaned up, the devil has a harder time. He can't flow in on my authority, misused authority, abused authority. He has a hard time because my authority will stop him. The greatest thing that you can do for your kids is to get that wall tore down. Because then Satan can't use your authority to misuse it because of things interpreted into that wall. Guys, it, it's, have you ever driven just the streets of Marshall? Now, Marshall's a little old country town. Sometimes this scares the fire out of me when you see a little baby in diapers walking down the road. Happens a lot. Little kids. You don't know how many times I, I have 
prayed. Little, little, little girls, not even in school yet, walking halfway across town to go to somebody's house with no grown-ups around. No, they just go and do whatever they want. There's no protection. There's no nothing. And one of those kids gets abused or, or missing, then everybody gets freaked out about it. You know, that wouldn't have happened if there was an adult with them, if there had been authority. But why is that not happening? Because mom and dad have no respect for themselves because there is a, there is a brick called rejection the devil put in their own lives. They don't care about themselves, therefore they can't care about their kids. You see how this works. And let me tell you something. You can see in a family, a little girl comes up and says, I was sexually abused if mom starts saying, shh, 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 shh. That's because mom was abused, and if it comes out, there's consequences for it. A normal mom She'd have picked up a baseball bat and says, you show me who does it, and that'll be the last doggone thing he ever does. I may end up in jail, but I will feel good while I'm there, and I'll make sure all the other kids are protected. You see, that's the normal response. But can you see that if I have these bricks in my wall, instead of God speaking justice to me, I have these bricks speaking injustice to me. Shh, just cover it up. Don't, don't, don't rock the boat. I tell you what. If I'm in a godly boat and the sea's trying to rock it, Jesus can still it. But if I see an enemy boat, I want to sink it. I don't want to, I want to sink the sucker. You give me a torpedo, you give me a rock, you give me something. It's my job in the kingdom to sink that thing. The Bible says that we're supposed to expose evil. You can't expose what has taken up residency within you. Because if it was going to be exposed, it would be exposed as a stronghold. You can't, you can't expose something that you've not pulled down. So let's, let's just keep it under. How many of our government officials know there's wrong going on, but they can't reveal it because of the long laundry list others have on them? Quit pro quo. You rat on me, I'll sink your boat. I'm looking for one, just one, who will come out and say, I've gotten right with God. Here are all the dirty things that I did that I'm trying to make right. And now that I've got that out and and those sheets are now flapping out in the breeze, let me tell you about a whole other junkyard that we need to deal with because now there's there's no skeletons that I have not revealed first that they can threaten me with. And let me tell you what's really going on. You know, I think we had a president almost do that once. The Sunday before JFK was assassinated at Columbia University, he said that there are powers outside of our government that control our government. And he said that he was going to reveal them before he got out of the presidency. And within the week, he was dead. I mean, this is how deep this stuff goes. And you can't stand against that if you got this wall. You can't stand against the spirit of poverty when you have a brick with the spirit of poverty right here that that thing is influencing you. That thing will speak to you. There, there is a demonic presence there. It's a stronghold. It's a fort. It's a fortified area, and that demon uses the pain that created it to protect itself. I just can't talk about that. It just, it just brings up too much. That's not you saying that. That's the gatekeeper saying, don't, don't, don't talk about the man behind the curtain. Because you open it up and it starts talking like this. <laughs> he sounds real big until you get that thing open. In spiritual warfare, one of the things that we learn is that one of, the, one of the biggest tactics of the enemy, he will come into your life and he will get you feeling his feelings and he will make you think they're yours. That's right, right now why some people, their sexuality is all messed up and they say they were born that way. A spirit came in when they were young 
and they identified with the feelings of that spirit, and now they, ha- now they believe that those are their feelings, and if they ever get delivered, they go back to their original feelings. Some people are habitual liars because somewhere in their life they took on a spirit of lying, and the thought processes of that spirit of lying has become their thought processes. And they couldn't tell you the truth if it benefited them. I've known people like that. What color is this? Brother Mike, it's purple. I guarantee you, now where I come from, that's purple right there. Well, if you say it's black, I'll give you a million dollars. Can't do it. It's purple. (laughs) And they wonder why their life constantly is, because they have so identified with that stronghold, that thing is controlling their thought processes. And I mean, know that'll affect you spiritually. If you have a spirit of rejection, you can never go to God because God's rejecting you. It'll begin affecting what you do in the physical realm. And the whole time you think God is speaking that to you because Satan erects it between the altar of incense and the veil. So anything coming from that direction is God. You won't believe the stuff that we have, we have went through over the years and have heard. Somebody has a spirit of lust and a spirit of dissatisfaction. And, well, well God has shown me I'm praying for Brother Jimmy to die so that I can marry his wife. How many know that's wrong with a capital W? Saw it in the faith movement. You know, guy works, guy's working 70 hours a week, gets a brand new car, it's real nice because he needs it for his job. The guy's working 70 hours a week. And so a guy that works 10 hours a week says, God told me you're going to give me your car. I'm thinking when pigs fly, that wasn't God. Maybe God's going to tell you to get up off your blessed assurance and start working like I'm working so that you can go ahead and buy your own. Come on. But can you see? And all the time they're thinking it's God because it's coming from the wall. It's coming from the wall. I'm no good, so I got to, that's what I bring into my life. I'm no good. I'm rejected. Self-deception. All these things are, are speaking into my soul. And the Bible says that we have the power of God to bring every thought, every thought. Why? Because that wall speaks. Every thought. The first thing to begin bringing down those strongholds is to identify that that's a block that's standing between you and God. Got to have deliverance. And deliverance can come easy or deliverance can come hard. Deliverance comes easy through repentance, identification, and if you begin working against that strong man to pull him down, God will bring deliverance your way. Mary and I have spent hours sometimes working with people for deliverance, and there's been a few times we spent about 30 seconds because the groundwork was already done. You see, it ha- it, it'll, it'll say that it has a legal right to stay because of this, because of that, because of this. Well, this is what they do. They think my thoughts, therefore I have a right to stay. Well, how about if they repent of your thoughts and say, God did not call me to think that way. I refuse the spirit of rejection. I am accepted in Christ. I come against that spirit of rejection in the name of Jesus. I bind the strong man. He will not speak to me. He will not move in me. And guy, I'm getting ready to take your block out of my wall, and I'm going to cast it out of my life. Now, Father, you show me what I need to do to get that thing forever out of my life. I bind the gatekeeper. I bind the strong man. They will not speak. They will not influence me anymore. And you find out if you can just get one block out of that wall, that what is from the throne can begin flowing through the hole. Just get one. Because what we've not realized, did you ever see in the movies there's like a dam built of blocks? And if one block comes out, the water starts flowing, what starts happening to the other blocks? They just kind of start flying out with the water because there's such pressure behind that wall. 
And see, what is behind that wall is the throne of God. God wanting to get to you. What you don't, there, there's a song that talks about, it's called Mercy Came Running. Have you guys ever heard that? As soon as justice was done, it was mercy that came out from underneath that veil and ran to that individual where they were. Mercy's on the back side of that wall saying, give me a weak spot. Give me some place. Give me some place to go through. Give me some place to make it. Just, just pick one. Just pick one. Just one block somewhere and bring the blood of Jesus into it. Bring the kingdom of God into it. Attack the block. Just get that one out of the way so that my hand can get through to you and I will force the rest to fall. How many of us have had God do one thing in our life and it caused a chain reaction of good? Uh, That's what God's after. God wants nothing. He wants that veil open. Jesus died to rent that veil so that what's in the spirit of God can flow, what's in the kingdom of God, his throne, can flow to you unhindered. Oh. I'm going to open my Bible and i got to go back here to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. How many know that's good stuff? I keep on trying to preach it. I need to read this for a minute so I can preach some more. Casting down. Casting down. You reach in, you grab that block, that lie, and you cast it down. You grab rejection. And you say it was a lie. The reason that individual rejected me is because they were rejected. Rejected grabbed me and tried to reject me. That wasn't God. That was a spirit of rejection attacked you to keep you from realizing that God, through Jesus, accepted you. And you take that thing and you bind it up. You grab it and you cast it down out of the wall. That'll stop self-sabotage. That'll stop this stuff replicating in your life. Casting down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the doctrine of your denomination. How many know that sometimes the doctrine of a denomination and the knowledge of God are two different things? It's this word, the knowledge of God. And what that really represents is the knowledge that comes from God. The knowledge that comes from God. That because of the cross, I am accepted. That it was not the will of God this happened. That's truth. It was not the will of God. Because it wasn't the will of God, Jesus went to the cross to bring the will of God into your life which is healing and restoration and freedom from that thing. That's the knowledge of God. God created me to be free. God created me to overcome. God created me to get past this thing and gave me the strength to grab a hold of that and said, you do not belong in me. This was wrong. I did not deserve it. Now get out of here in the name of Jesus. Casting it down. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought. Every time that thing tries to speak, you bind it up and say, I I thank the thoughts of God. I have the mind of Christ. I've got his words written down. The Apostle Paul says, think on these things. What was he trying to get them to do? If you thank the word, the appropriate word, If you have a spirit of rejection, the devil will try to get you to gravitate. I am nothing but a worm. I am nothing but a worm. I am nothing but a worm. A worm am I. He'll not not get you things where you have been accepted in the beloved. That that rejection was nailed to the cross. That pain was nailed to the cross. You have the right to bring every thought into captivity. It's your right and your responsibility. I have it. I don't have to accept what the world says. I don't have to accept what my own head tells me when it speaks from that wall. 
we have a right to say, that is a lie, that is wrong. How many times I've done that in my life? The devil will whisper in my ear, and I'll say, that's a lie. I caught you now, Jack. You weren't quite as slick as you used to be, and I now know what that is, and that is a lie. I do not receive it, and I, and I will go in the Word of God and find just the opposite. Counter it and say, this is what God said, and I apply this to my thought life, and I'll meditate on it. And that, that strong man begins to get weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. Because what you feed gets strong, what you starve out gets weak. But he didn't even just stop there. And having in a readiness, this is still part of, of our spiritual warfare, having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. The greatest revenge, the greatest revenge, hear me, the greatest revenge against the spirit that's held you captive is getting free. If he filled you with anger all the time, how many of us have ever fought against a spirit of anger? You were just angry all the time and you just needed just a little trigger just to set you off. And it was so out of proportion, somebody did a little something and you dropped an A-bomb. Just went, just go ahead, I got a hair trigger and I just need to go off on somebody today. Why'd you do that? Because somebody filled you with anger as a kid. Somebody wounded you. Somebody did something. Words have power. Actions have power. And even neglect has power. You'll think God just neglects you. Well, yeah. How many of us have ever heard, well, God will do it for anybody but me? That's a devil. That's the but me devil. No. If God's going to get in the word, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. If God's going to do it for anybody, he's going to do it for me because I'm lining up with the word. I'm trying to function in his kingdom. I'm embracing what he said. The greatest revenge that you can get is to get free and to have God establish just the opposite in your life. Some of the most angry Oh man, I, I got I got faces coming to mind when I was in the military. I mean, I got some guys that before Jesus got a hold of them, they wouldn't think twice about killing you, and they and they were trained by the government on how to do it. We actually had one guy had to God did such work in his life he actually asked to be relieved of special forces duties. Why, God, I'm built like a brick wall would take a life and not even think about that. If they said, pull the trigger, he'd pull the trigger, didn't care why, why, you know, it didn't matter. And it, he, he, he always, the officers were scared of him. Jesus moved into his heart. God started working on him. That dude turned into the biggest muscle-bound teddy bear you have ever seen in your life. And, he got, and so he said, he goes, I can't do this anymore. I, I cannot do what you're, I, I can't do it anymore. Why not? Because God moved in and I can't do what God has set me free of and I'm not angry anymore. I'm not full of hatred anymore. He was just using his military duties and, and spec ops to release his anger and his hatred and that murderous spirit. And now that that was gone, he couldn't do that anymore. And God took, flipped that thing around, and now he has a castle of God's love established in him where the king can rule and reign in his life. Instead of a stronghold, he went to a castle. Amen. Cleaned it up. And did you know, for the ones that hurt him and abused him, the greatest revenge he got was saying, it no longer has a hold of me. It no longer has a hold of me. If we'll, if we'll yield into this thing, God has made you the traffic cop of the thoughts in your life. You can tell which ones can go, which ones have got to stop. And he gave you the authority to do it. Because, guys, it is time to tear down that wall. 
Because as long as that wall is there, you're a prisoner. You're a POW. Even though you've been set free spiritually, it's never going to work its way through to the physical realm until it can make its way through your soul. That's why James said, receive with meekness. If God said it, that's just it. If God said, don't ever do this, then don't ever do it. Just receive it with meekness. God says, this is the way it is, then that's just the way it is. I don't care if you don't like me or not, God does. (laughs) What a freeing thing. Devil, I don't care if you don't like me, God does. Spirit of rejection, I reject you. How does that feel? Spirit of hatred, I hate you. I hate anything embracing hatred. That thing that works so hard to get embedded into your life like a tick. Just imagine as it's wandering in dry places because it don't have a home anymore is the greatest revenge that you could ever have in your life. Not only is it revenge there, but only free people set people free. You can't be caught in pornography and set someone else free of pornography. You can't be full of hatred and sin and get someone set free in the kingdom. But what you have been set free of becomes a testimony that inspires others to get free. And so not only does your spirit of rejection, your spirit of rebellion, your spirit of hatred, your spirit of whatever, not only does it get kicked out of your life, God begins to use you to kick it out of other people's lives. What else could be the greatest revenge on the world and the earth and to see it brought down in everybody else's life? People want to know why I, I, I so love to teach. It's because I'm coming against a spirit of stupidity. I used to be stupid, then God showed up. Do the stupidest things. My brain would shut off, and I would just self-sabotage and do all these stupid things. Now what I want you to do, I want you to be the opposite of stupid. I would not have you be ignorant, my brethren, of his devices. But to be well-informed so that you could pull down those strongholds in your life. And God is loosing and anointing this morning. And what you don't realize, guys, well, Mike, he's a, it's, a, it's a strong hold with a strong man on the inside. Your hands with Jesus in them is the thing that strong man fears the most. If I can reach out in what Jesus has done for me, there's no demonic strong man that can overpower Jesus in me. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I want our praise and worship team to come forward this morning.